Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company taking a look at two Ruger Mini 14s, which are definitely not forgotten weapons by any stretch of the imagination. However, I think there are some very valuable lessons that we can take from these two rifles. Uh, because they are still considered such common guns, and well, they are literally such common guns, we've never looked at these up on the channel before, and well, I think it's time that we do. So uh, these are of course Mini 14s. The the original intent, the uh, the idea behind the Mini 14, as the name implies, was to take the M14 U.S. military rifle and scale it down for the 5.56-223 cartridge. Now it's interesting. Bill Ruger uh, really himself honestly believed that had he come out with this rifle five years earlier, it would have been adopted by the US military instead of the M16. I don't think that's really quite realistic, but the Mini 14 has become, and remains today, an extremely popular rifle. It's seen service with a whole bunch of different law enforcement and military organizations. Uh, this one here is actually a Texas Rangers rifle. Uh, there are French security organizations that have adopted the, the Ruger as the AMD, uh, Mousqueton AMD, and put them together in France. They've been purchased by a couple of militaries, although not a lot, but a whole lot of police and security services, as well as hundreds of thousands of them made for the civilian market. So we have a bit of a conundrum in how do you sell hundreds of thousands of these guns? Well, you have to do it by making them economically priced. We know that the M14 is a really ridiculously expensive rifle to manufacture. So how do you scale it down but not maintain the same sort of expensive price in manufacturing? That is one of the things that Ruger is really good at. So let's take a look and see how they did it. All right, so we're going to compare an M1A up here, which is effectively the same as an M14 in terms of uh, manufacturing, to our Mini 14 down here. And we're going to look at a couple different elements. First we'll look at design, and then we'll look at the machining and the fabrication techniques. So as you can see just from the outside, the similarity is really quite obvious. But our design differs, especially in the gas system. The M14 gas system is really the most substantial thing that differentiates the M14 from the M1 Garand. Yes, I know there were mag detachable box magazines added, but that's a pretty simple adaptation. You'll see the Italians do that with the BM-59 very quickly and easily, and cheaply. And the M14 was not a cheap rifle to develop. And a lot of what they spent their time doing was adding this gas system. So where the M1 had an operating rod that ran all the way up and was directly uh, hit by, well, it had the gas piston at the end of the operating rod, the M14 splits those into two separate pieces. So you have the operating rod here, and then the gas piston is actually confined in this gas tube right here. There's a little vent hole, and so the idea here is that this is a self-regulating piston. When it opens up all the way, it clears that hole. Any remaining excess gas vents out there, and if you can see slow motion footage of an M14 firing, you'll see a little spurt of gas here every time it fires from that excess gas venting out. Uh, you can pull the front of it off to clean it out. Um, that's This system was, uh, was really quite a lot of the developmental process. Naturally, that's going to be expensive. So Ruger took a look at that and went, mm, yeah, we don't need that. How about instead we just have a little gas vent right here connected to our gas block. And instead of finally, you know, finally pressing the gas block onto the barrel, we'll just clamp it on there with four hex head screws. And, uh, and then we'll just vent gas directly into this block of the operating rod. Go ahead and take the mainspring out here. So the front end of the Mini 14 operating rod uh, is just a blind hole. Gas vents into that almost like a direct impingement system. Uh, there is no moving piston in this gun. Gas vents in there, and then this whole piece, this operating rod, gets pushed backwards. That really simplifies the design of the gun. And by the way, uh, it wasn't Bill Ruger who actually designed the Mini 14. It was actually Jim Sullivan, the same guy who had been 50% uh, of the team that scaled the AR-10 down into the AR-15. Well, 
uh, by the late 1960s he had gone to work for Ruger, and he designed their M77 bolt-action rifle, and he designed the Mini-14 for them. Another example of this simplification is the roller here on the Mini-14 bolt, which, yeah, that's not actually a roller, that's a solid protrusion. It's designed to look the same as the roller on an M14 bolt, but, and, and I should say actually, at the very beginning, the very first series of Mini-14s, this was actually a roller. But they fairly quickly realized, yeah, we don't actually need it to roll. So they got rid of that, and now it's just a solid protrusion. That saves some more machining time. If we look at the sights, the M14 of course has this military lineage adjustable, very fine, excellent, high quality, and time-consuming to make uh, blade front sight. The standard Mini-14 front sight is a single pinned-on block. It's got a, a big, uh, slightly tapered post to it, but far easier to make than this. And the rear sight is the same. Uh, the M14, or M1A, has this very precisely made, very fine click adjustable windage and elevation rear sight. This really is one of the, the major strengths of the M14 rifle. We don't get too cynical, one might say one of the only strengths of the M14 rifle. But when Ruger copied it, they vastly simplified that design. So it's now just a little sheet metal peep sight there, and you have a spring plunger, and you can push that plunger down and rotate this wheel to adjust your elevation. Not quite as easy as the click system on the M14. You've got the same thing for, uh, for windage. So far cheaper, far easier. And this is the thing that a lot of, you know, your precision shooters are obviously not going to like this. But there's a vast market out there of people who have a much more pedestrian uh, role in mind for their rifles. And this works, you know, this is fine. Uh, for 90% of people, and that's the sort of attitude that Ruger takes, is whatever is fine for most people is going to keep our costs down and make the gun much more affordable and accessible. One more element that we'll look at here is the bolt hold open on the M14. You know, we've got machined cuts here, we've got a separate piece there. Uh, this requires, it has to be milled out, you know, this isn't a casting or a stamping or anything. That's how you hold the bolt open. Sullivan and Ruger took a look at that and went, well, that's, that's complicated, we can probably do this much more easily. And so they have this recess on the side of the receiver covered by a, uh, a little stamped plate. And under that is their bolt hold open, which kind of flies out when you take the plate off. It is a little cast part here, and a spring, and this just pivots up and down. Now while this looks like it has you know, as many features to it, you know, as many different cuts and dimensions and everything, as the M14 version, this is actually a much simpler sort of piece to make, because this can be cast as a single part with very little required finished machining. None of the, none of the surfaces on this are really all that precise. They don't have to be. Um, and the same thing with the receiver. You can cast, uh, and we'll talk about the receiver casting in a minute, you can cast all these features, these holes, uh, into it, uh, and again there's very little finish machining required, and that makes this a much faster and easier thing to produce. Now let's talk about manufacturing processes, because Ruger is at its heart a casting company. That's their core strength, that's what they understand how to do, and they understand how to do it really well. A lot of people will think, will, will hear the word cast, and just automatically assume that this is some sort of crappy inferior methodology for making cheap parts quickly. Well, it is a less expensive way to do things, it is a relatively quick way to do things, but if casting is done right, it is absolutely no worse than plain machining, and it can be a whole lot faster. If you want to take a block of steel this big, and use a massive press to slam it into the basic, squish it into the basic out, outline of a receiver, and then spend a lot of machine time cutting away all the parts that aren't M14 receiver, you can do that, and you'll end up with something like this. And as long as it's done right, and heat treated right, this is an essential element that some people leave out, um, you can end up with a really good receiver. But you can also end up with a really good receiver by casting it, 
as long as your heat treat's good, your finished machining is done where it's necessary, just like a forged receiver. Like, there's nothing fundamentally wrong about this. And because Ruger has developed the, the company uh, expertise in how to do casting, this is really an excellent option for them. So if we look up close at this, you can see a lot of the cast surfaces. Looking at the bottom here in particular, you can see that this is, this is a cast surface. And because Ruger is good at this, they, they don't need to do as much finish machining as a lot of other uh, companies would. People with less experience and less expertise in this type of manufacturing uh, would have to do a lot more finish machining. Ruger's got this down really well, and that allows them to keep their costs way down. The whole operating rod assembly here is cast, although it looks like they've used weld to reinforce uh, this joint, which is probably a wise decision. That's obviously going to be the weak part of, of this component. But uh, most of this doesn't require any finish machining. You know, the outside uh, profile of this block, for example, it doesn't matter if it's within a thousandth of an inch of spec, because it doesn't interact with anything. It doesn't need to be. So you can save a lot of money by loosening the spec on something like this, casting it, don't bother with any finish machining. In fact, you can see a seam line on there, right here. And uh, you know, your part's much more uh, rapid to manufacture. If you're trying to market this to people who are really, uh, well, I, I could say snobby, or I could say really uh, particular about wanting a very highly finished firearm, then okay, fine, they're not going to really like this. But if you're trying to market this to a much broader audience of people who want a gun that will work, and don't really care about how the insides look, well, this becomes a much more enticing option. The surfaces back here, where the, uh, the cam track is controlling bolt movement, those do require a better uh, better precision, and so those are finish machined. You can really get a feel for this in the fire control groups as well. So our M14 fire control group, or M1A fire control group, every piece in here is elaborately machined. Which is fine, that, that's great, that makes a good product, but it is time consuming and expensive. These guys, in the Mini 14, pretty much every component in here is cast, and it's a lot quicker to make. And so surfaces that require finished machining, like the sear interfaces here, those get it. The ones that don't require it, don't get it. I think this is a good example of like the 80-20 rule. 20% uh, of the effort will get you 80% of the results in most things. And of course in design and manufacturing, everything is a trade-off and a compromise. And so Ruger has deliberately looked at how do we minimize the amount of work required without sacrificing too much quality in order to get a gun that is reliable and effective and will meet the needs of a very wide audience. Everyone from private civilians to security law enforcement agencies and even some military agencies. And they've obviously come up with a winning uh, solution, not just here in the Mini 14, but in a wide variety of their products. Hopefully uh, hardcore fans of the show will, uh, will have enjoyed taking a look at some of the technical elements here of the Mini 14. I think we, hopefully, what we have here is a little bit of a, a different line of discussion than what you normally see about these rifles, and hopefully you guys uh, enjoyed it and got something interesting out of it. These rifles are both, of course, coming up for sale here at Rock Island. It's not like Mini 14s are hard to come by, but yeah, these are both actually pretty cool examples. A pre-band stainless steel folding stock model and a provenance Texas Ranger gun. So if you'd like to take a look at the catalog pages for either of these, uh, hit up the description text below. You'll find a link there to ForgottenWeapons.com, and on the Forgotten Weapons blog post with this video, you'll find links to both catalog pages for these two rifles. Those have their pictures, uh, Rock Island's descriptions, their price estimates, and all that sort of stuff. Thanks for watching.